Well, hey, everybody. It's Josh with Resort TV One. We're excited tonight to have a very special guest here on our stream uh, for the very first time. And um, let me figure out. Hold on, guys, just a second. We've got a little bit of um, echo going on here, and I'm not exactly sure what that is. Okay. Do you guys hear that? Okay. Cat, do you have speakers on your computer? I'm sorry. No? Yeah, we've got the echo going on. Sorry, guys. I thought we had all that figured out. Let me see. Hopefully, I... All right. Um, hold on, guys. Um, I'm not sure where the echo is coming from. Let me get just a second here. All right. So, um, Kat, do you have, I'm sorry, do you have uh, speakers on on your computer where, where you're playing the stream in the background somewhere, like on another browser tab or something? Okay. Um, let's see. There we go. Oh, no more echo. We're good. Okay. We fixed it. All right. We're good now. All right. Sorry about that. All right. There we go. So let's get back to the intro. Sorry about that, guys. That doesn't usually happen, but we are back. So again, we have a very, very special stream tonight and uh, we're super excited to welcome our guest. Um, I think everybody here um, in this community knows her as the amazing voice and face of the bride in the Haunted Mansion attic scene, Constance Hatchaway. However, besides this iconic role, she has an amazing list of appearances and voiceovers in several different genres, including TV, sports, movies, video games, and, of course, theme park attractions. She's voiced Jessie the Cowgirl for Toy Story Projects, Dee Dee from Dexter's Laboratory, and even Princess Leia in some Star Wars video games. She's also voice-matched actresses such as Sigourney Weaver, um, Anne Hathaway, Julia Roberts, and Angelina Jolie, just to name a few. She's been the voice of uh, Pardon the Interruption on ESPN and even announced the NFL Draft. Um, and she's appeared on camera in several comedy soap operas and other TV shows, but she discovered that her true passion was for voice acting. Uh, her love for Disney and the parks began when, as a little girl, she would go backstage at Disneyland with her father, who worked with Disney Imagineering. Uh, from there, she went on to become a Disneyland cast member against her parents' wishes as a narrator on the storybook Canal Boats, and that's where her love of voice acting truly began. So I uh, want to share really quick um, her scene in the Haunted Mansion uh, before we bring her on. So uh, this is a, a very familiar scene to everybody in the Haunted Mansion ride uh, where we meet the bride, uh, Constance Hatchaway. So enjoy this little clip here, everybody. There we go. Let me try that one more time. So it is my honor and my pleasure again to introduce the one and only Kat Cressida. Welcome, Kat. Hello. <laughs> 
There we go. Forgot to push the button. Oh my goodness. All right. So anyway, we got all the issues behind us. We're super excited to have Kat here tonight. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about some amazing things here. We are, uh, we've got some great questions that people sent in and she's got some great things to talk about. Um, and uh, really all the way from Haunted Mansion, um, you know, to some of her uh, animation roles, uh, to some things that are very special to her in her life and, uh, and things moving forward. So we've got a lot of things to cover. Uh, so we'll get right into it. So first of all, uh, as the bride, Constance Hatchaway, um, what's something most people don't know about Constance? That she is the only Disney villain on record that actively conscientiously kills, like that her agenda is to kill, which takes her, um, makes her very unusual for the Disney universe. Now, of course, there's been Disney villains who have consequently killed or off screen you get the gist that maybe somebody got killed but it's never directly storylined built into the character right that they're a killer right um whereas in the real you know in in most cinema certainly universal and and their whole monster universe you know villains are killers right that's their, their ultimate goal is to basically you know and, and to do so cold-heartedly and um conscientiously and they get joy out of it and she's the only disney character who gets joy out of killing does so conscientiously and that's her main agenda <laughs> right <laughs> yeah so that that definitely is something most people don't know and and um so uh, talk a little bit about the role. Um, I, somebody had a really good question on Facebook um, because I think what a lot of people don't know is you are you are the voice, of course, but you're also the face. So how did that all work when you were getting that put together? Was there like a lot of well, makeup or special effects or how did that work? Um, I'm So it's a composite. It's a computer composite. And um, they, there certainly was some reference footage taken initially, what, you know, back when we recorded, but they, the main face was initially the beautiful blonde actress that you see in the portraits okay so that so that was supposed to be her main face but i guess as they developed it they started to integrate some computer cgi and then some elements of me as well so she's more her face is more a composite okay that makes sense that's really cool i, I didn't know that so there is actually a different actress in the in the portraits throughout the attic there that we just looked at oh yeah Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And that's what I, that's what I kind of thought as I looked through there. So that's interesting. So it's a combination. And so they, they actually did video record you as you were, uh, as you were delivering the lines uh, for the attraction. That's what I believe they did. Okay. There's, there's definitely certain ex expressions and certain facial where it's, it's almost truly me. And then there's right. others where it's not. So she's, she's really a, you know, CGI composite. Okay. So, and that kind of leads me into my next question. Uh, what's it like to ride the Haunted Mansion either here or at Disneyland? I know you're, you're in California, of course. What's it like to ride and hear yourself and kind of see like your own facial expressions there? What's that like? It's a very, so the, it will always be, and it will always feel like an amazing pinch me i can't believe that i'm actually you know a, a character in the haunt that will never ever settle in my brain as being a reality it still feels and seems without any exaggeration too good to be true because i grew up you know loving the classic attractions i grew up loving the mythos and the the backstories of the mansion you know the deep deep disney history the stuff that you see me put up on my twitter every morning right um and on my on my ig stories every day so it still doesn't quite connect. So when we're standing online and people are excited and they're like, oh, this is be so, you know, there's still a part of me that doesn't quite believe it in a sense, right. even though I know, you know, that it's true. Um, but it's never comfortable to enter the attic. The, the minute that I start hearing the heartbeat and mm -hmm. the minute that I hear my voice, I, I think this is, a, you know, if I'm being authentic, it's a, probably understandable to anybody when I say it takes me out of the story. Right. Because all of a sudden, that's my voice. And I know that it's my voice. Right. No. I, what, <laughs> and, and being the perfectionist actress that I am. Right. Sometimes all I hear is, oh, I wish I'd done that a little bit. You know, there's there's the talent part of you that's never quite satisfied as well. Um, well, that's when why. I first started, Go ahead. Yeah. What? When I first started yeah. writing it, um, how is our audio, by the way? Is the level, the volume getting strong? 
I, I believe so. Yeah, I just when we came out of the uh, the video, I forgot to hit the unmute button. That was the the problem. That's why I did the intro twice. But I think cool. um, we are good. Everybody, let us know in the chat if the audio sounds good. Yes, but, and, and you're yeah. seeing me clearly, right? You should be. Because Looks clear I'm on my screen. Okay, cool. So, um, yep, they said it's yeah, great. When I first started writing it, like the very first time, I was so nervous and so worried you know, what it was going to be like and what, not, not that I questioned the Imagineers, but I, I certainly was, you know, I was one of those purists that didn't want to see a attraction that I love, um, you know, maybe not ch change for the best. Right. So I was nervous. Once, once I realized the beautiful job they did with it, I mean, you know, the portraits, they described to me what they were going to look like, but man, that was amazing and yeah. saw her. Oh my God. She's re she really is life-size and quite frightening. <laughs> and the voice sounded amazing. All the, the little tiny, um, you know, post-production that they'd done with it and the scrubbing forward and backward. It just sounds amazing. And oh, yeah. then we wrote it a couple of more times. And once I relaxed into, okay, so they did a fantastic job. Then I didn't even want to hear me. Then it was like, okay, I'm just going to, close my, I don't want to hear it. And I just want to enjoy the attic without hearing me. And it's still kind of like that because I love the mansion and the ballroom. Oh yeah. For me is one of the most astonishing, astonishing um, scenes ever created in a dark ride. It's lavish and it's so immersive and you really can just study it for probably, you know, a couple of hours and still pick up on some details that you didn't catch before. Absolutely. And so, it's always a little bit jarring because <laughs> it's like, and there it's me. And there it's you. Yeah. And that's, I, I was going to say, there are some actors and actresses I know that, that talk about, um, you know, they never want to, uh, you know, to watch or to listen, you know, to what they've done because they are too critical or they get nervous or whatever. And, and so yeah. I, I totally get that. And certainly when I listen yeah. to myself play, uh, saxophone that's my main instrument there's every once in a while I'm like that too I'm like oh I should have hit this note a little better or I, should, I was a little out of tune there you know so I, I do get that for sure yeah so cool so um what's your what's your earliest memory um you know as as a little girl I know you came to the parks a lot with your family and especially your dad working with Imagineer as I mentioned in the, in the intro um yeah. what what's your first memory of riding the Haunted Mansion then do you remember Oh, well, my first memory of the mansion is screaming bloody murder, murder in the foyer. He, my, my father loved to tell me the story behind the attraction. So we would stand in front of the attraction, not yet in the line. And he would describe to me what the Imagineers and what Walt had planned for those attractions. And back in, this was in the um, mid to late seventies. So back then it was still very close to Walt's park. You know, they hadn't really destroyed or taken down a lot of what he had created. Right. Um, Tomorrowland had certainly evolved a bit, um, but it by and large was still Walt's park. Um, only 20 years past, you know, when he had created it. So we would stand in front of the attractions and I would learn the, the backstory, what it was supposed to be, what the first original ideas was, how it evolved. He loved he really geeked out on that stuff. So I was learning stuff that I am willing to bet 99.9% .9 of anybody going to the park was not really paying attention to, you know, the paint color right. and the fonts <laughs> and notice, notice that the paint, the texture, you know, on the line for the ride, as you approach the attraction has changed um, going from land to land, how the texture under your feet would change. This was all stuff that the original Imagineers had painstakingly, worked on um, right. every detail mattered to Walt Disney, which makes it quite unique from Walt Disney world um, because it, it, it just had a different mindset behind it once it, you know, kind of became the Florida project. Right. But anyway, so that's what we would do is we'd stand in front of an attraction. So my first memories of the mansion are standing in front of it. Um, probably he, I'm guessing he probably put me up um, in the, in the Disneyland uh, version of the mansion. Obviously, it's a much shorter lead-in. Um, they've got a side queue, of course. It's exactly. Right. Well. But he would put me up on that little brick wall with the green railing behind it that was sort of roughly in front of the mansion, kind of where the hearse is now. They've moved the hearse over the years. So kind of where the hearse is now. We would be there, and he would hold on to me. 
but I was tiny. So he would put me up on the little wall and hold on to me. And he would describe the story of the mansion, the backstory, the, the history of it. And what with Master the, Gracie and Madame Leota and all the characters that play into it. Um, more so the, like he would point up to the little weather vane and say, do you know why? Oh yeah. It's a ship. And I would say, because it was a sea captain, but it's not, it's not the version that most people think it's changed and evolved over the years. Disney itself has evolved the history over the years. The original stories were um, much more romantic, gothic, much more associated with um, what you'd find in an Edgar Allan Poe kind of a, a situation, very romance novel gothic. And in fact, the opening credits of Don Hahn's, you know, Haunted Mansion movie, it's Don Hahn, right? That was the director? I'm getting that right, I, I think hope. so, yeah. Um, anyway, the opening credits, that, that whole little story that they sort of show at the beginning um, without words, you know, the opening credits, that was kind of the gist of what the original bride's story was. Hmm. And the sea captain was not evil or mad. In fact, he was just from a different station in life. So it was kind of the reverse. So in the Haunted Mansion movie, Master Gracie is, you know, sort of the, the aristocrat and she's not. But in the original story, it was the bride, the young gal who was of an esteemed station in New Orleans society. And the sea captain was not. But um, he wooed her. He fell in love with her. The father's, you know, proposition to her was um, if he can accrue enough wealth and earn a title, uh, you know, be worthy of you, then I will bestow your hand in marriage. It's that whole kind of cool right. backstory. And he would tell me that. And so I would be prepped mentally. But he also shared with me all of the crazy different ways that the mansion had evolved from the Imagineering side of things. So I was learning both sides. Unfortunately, the first time I entered the mansion after all of that amazing storytelling, right. I screamed bloody murder. I was terrified. The, the music right. and the wall, I remember the wallpaper scared the, in the foyer, which isn't even scary. The chandelier, yeah. something about the vibes scared the heck out of me. And I was only five. But I was screaming and crying. And of course, a cast member after about 30 seconds politely invited my father to remove me <laughs> from the attraction. Right. Um, he didn't listen. He was like, oh, she'll calm down. You know, once, <laughs> once we're on the attraction, she's she's great. She'll you know, she'll get into it. I guess they let him. We entered the stretching room and that was it was game over. Yep. I I went ballistic. And while I'm sure some people probably got a kick out of it, you know, it's kind of funny to watch a kid have a meltdown. The cast members were not. So we got escorted out politely. <laughs> that was my first experience. In well, here I was going to say, hearing that, hearing that iconic narration too, that's, it's so funny because my son um, was a little younger when we, we took him in there and he said, yeah, I'll be brave. I got this. I'll be brave. And we got into the stretch room. And, 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 you know, welcome foolish mortals started. And he was like, I'm done. Get me out of here. And we, so, yeah, that was a very similar experience. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's so cool. So um, as far as um, let's see here, we had a had a couple of really good questions in the chat. There was one. OK, so they wanted to know um, what year did you record uh, for Constance and how long was the process of recording? So let's see. Um, I'm pretty sure that we recorded. Well, there was a number of callbacks right. and um, I've done some real if, if anybody's interested, rather than taking up a lot of, you know, everybody's awesome time on the whole story of the callbacks, because that's a whole um, I, I did a great interview for like the OC register where we talked about the whole process. But but roughly speaking, anytime you audition for Imagineering, First of all, you don't know what you're auditioning for, and it's going to be several rounds. You're going to go in initially. They're going to decide if you're even in the right ballpark. Uh, they're going to keep narrowing it down so you have more and more callbacks. So there was a couple of callbacks. And um, and then it, once it once I finally knew what it was for, there was the final callback. Um, once I knew what attraction it was for, which, of course, I wish I didn't know because that made me far more nervous. Right. Knowing that it was a shot. I mean, a once in a lifetime shot, most likely to be a major character in a classic attraction that wasn't there before and that was being so beautifully and painstakingly created. 
with new technology. So um, my memory is that it was in 2004 that we recorded. Um, yeah, 2004. And I think it went in at the end of 2004. Um, and then it, another year later, it went into Walt Disney World. So. Okay. Yeah, I, I yeah. wasn't sure about that if it went in at different times in the different parks. Uh, I wasn't aware and I wasn't really covering or following other than just as a casual fan at that point. So, okay, yeah. that's cool. I'm pretty so. sure that it was like a year. They, they tested it in Disneyland and once it was like, you know, yay. Then they put it in Walt Disney World. And then a few years later, they put it in whichever of the Asian parks has the traditional Florida mansion in it. Right, right. Okay. So, so she's in three parks right now. I'm, Const I'm, she's in three <laughs> Constance is in three parks. And have you seen, uh, on the subject of Constance still, have you seen her um, uh, character that, that rides down Main Street in the parade, kind of floats down Main Street in the... Uh, the booty you parade, or I guess, I don't know if they have it at Disneyland as well, but I know at Disney world, they had that her, she was in there. Um, I, I mean, I, people have sent me videos and so I've, I've seen it like, you know, on YouTube. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It's really neat the way they, um, got her to kind of roll or float. It's, it's really neat. So anyway, yeah, really she's cool. on roller skates. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure <laughs> what, how, that, how that was done, but I figured they had something and somebody else was talking about how that uh, earlier about how the attic was their favorite scene. Actually, it's one of mine too, besides the ballroom, uh, not just because of the awesome, you know, the awesome constant story, but also there's so much detail. You can go through there and see something different every single time. Yeah. Chris Guzman was the Imagineer who was sort of the show director of that. And she really, really cared about those details the victorian china being cracked and the easter eggs there's a lot of easter eggs in there oh yeah and um only once did i have the opportunity to see it with the lights on to really you know see some of it and some of it unfortunately once the lighting is on you can't you can't even make out some of the amazing stuff but yeah they did a beautiful job absolutely yeah it's really the lighting is just perfect for all that so um let me see here i think that is almost everything about the uh, okay i have one more on here um was there a most memorable moment uh, of playing the bride or of, 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 you know, kind of getting into that role? Uh, was there one moment that stuck out above the rest or was it just kind of the whole experience was great? Of, of the actual recording session? Yeah, of the so, actual recording. Well, the actual recording sessions, again, because we had callbacks. <laughs> oh, and right. if you think about it, she's, I mean, she doesn't have a lot of lines. She's got the wedding vows, which right. are relatively short phrases. So um, it wasn't like we were recording reams of paragraphs of copy or anything that you would for, you know, say a narration, like if I was doing like the monorail narration where right. there'd be tons of paragraphs. Um, so it was, a once we got to the actual report session, it went relatively quickly, so quickly that I remember saying, is that all? Like, do you want to maybe try a different? They were like, no, we go, we want it. It was great because again, we had a number of sort of dress rehearsals with all the callbacks. So they knew what they wanted by the time they got in. There was a lot of people behind the glass weighing in on, you know, a lot of people sort of directing or on the on the engineer side of things. But they knew that they'd gotten what they wanted. The only thing that really sticks out to me was me asking, you know, could we could we drag out the recording session any longer? Because how it will probably never happen again that I'll get to voice such an iconic, amazing lead character for a classic attraction I'd grown up with that most no. people consider a classic. There's not that many of them left, you know, pirates right on a mansion. Yeah. I mean, I mean, those <laughs> you know, are the, in terms of like yeah. big, yeah. big production numbers. So, um, those are the two for sure. I well, remember that. And I remember, um, we did some at the end, we did some laugh, laughs, giggles, wry, different versions of laughter that they could, you know, sort of weave in between the lines. And um, I remember the moment, I don't, I think it was in a callback. I don't think it was in the recording session because I think that's, you know, why I was lucky enough to be honored to book it. But I remember the moment where it clicked, where my brain went, because we were, it, it was just wedding vows. And it's, it's kind of like that thing where hindsight is twenty twenty. Now everybody kind of knows, oh, sure, if you're going to do the bride and she's going to do wedding vows, they're going to be ironic and sarcastic. And there's going to be a twist halfway through them that makes it into a, a dead a death pun. 
Right. But at the time, they were just wedding vows. And I remember the moment where something that somebody said, one of the directors or maybe the main director, Brian Nevsky, said something like, just give it a little evil twist or a wink at the end. And my brain finally went, oh, I get it. So I do. I did. And I went, oh, that's really clever. So every wedding vow is one of those. Right. So that I remember that moment of, oh, that's clever. <laughs> so that's kind of when the light bulb came on as this is what I'm doing right now. That's that's what they were all looking for. But nobody had really known. I think it all kind of I think it happened organically. I mean, obviously, they intended the wedding vows to be somewhat wicked. Right. Obviously, that's the they they intended them to have somewhat of a um, sassy flavor to them. But I don't think it was until that moment that everybody kind of figured out exactly what that would sound like or what would sound right or what would make it work. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that is really cool. No, that's that's exactly what we were what we were talking about there with that that one iconic moment there and, and just, you know, when it really clicked. That is so cool. So um before we get into the next segment, um one last question about voicing uh characters, maybe a little bit more in general. Uh Corey Ruprecht here has a good question. Is there a character that you would really like to voice or somebody that kind of kinda of like it would be your dream um to voice? Um there, there is and there was, and I was lucky enough for like a storybook for a, a children's read-along book way back when there was still, um, uh, you know, the, the little the little records and an audio tape. I think it was an audio tape at the time. Sorry about the... Oh, it's okay. Sorry, this. Um, so back in, God, I feel like it was in 90... Probably 98, 99, 2000, I was honored for Walt Disney Records to record some audio. They were, I think they were cassettes at the time, or maybe they were even CDs by then. <laughs> I'm losing track. <laughs> um, but we recorded some of those, you know, books on tape or whatever you would call them, audio read-alongs. And that was a dream come true. And because um, growing up, I'd always been listening to those little 78 records. Right. Of, you know, when Tinkerbell rings her little bell, turn the page. Um, that iconic, iconic narration voice, which was Ginny, who used to be a Mouseketeer, and she took over as an adult, being sort of the, that famous voice of Disney, Walt Disney Records. Yeah. So that was my dream, was to do that narration, as well as um, Catherine Beaumont, who I studied so hard. I loved her voice. Uh, Catherine Beaumont, of course, is the amazing British actress who was both Alice and Wendy. Right. Um, Alice in Wonderland and Wendy and Peter Pan. And um, even as a cast member driving down to the park, I was listening to cassettes to get into the mood, to get into character for storybook land, to kind of get into the vibe um, rather than being frustrated on the five freeway for an hour. <laughs> and I studied her voice. I love she had such a beautiful, mellifluous, pretty, you know, perfect English sound. Um, her dialect is a is a bit of a watered down British. It's it's got some Americanisms in them, and I actually went to a dial a professional dialect coach for a while, who I was lucky enough to assist, and said, "Is this pure received English, or you know what version of of British is Catherine Beaumont's dialect?" And she said, "It's it's watered down. She's clearly lived in America for a while." So I I was studying her even yeah. as a, you know, as a college student. And I finally was honored to voice match her for some of those read alongs. So I got to, to voice Alice for some of those. And that was a real dream come true. Oh, that is cool. Yeah. And, and definitely, um, you know, thinking about dialects and things like that. And I think a lot of people that kind of goes into the whole, the art of, of voice acting is that, you know, you've got to think about not just that, but the diction and the, the, you know, the sound the tone quality and all those different things that go into a voice, yeah. um, especially when you're voice matching. And, and yeah, to yeah. even think about, it makes my head spin to think about a different dialect or a watered down American, slightly Americanized British. That is such a specific thing. So. They are so specific. You know, we, we audition for a lot of video games, especially these days, get very specific on the dialect they want. It's not just British anymore. It's, right. you know, West Country or it's, you know, uh, not just Ireland, but it's County Cork or think Northern Ireland. And wow. they know 
they'll know if the flavor and and the lilt is not correct. And now with the world being what it is, they can hire authentic Irish people from Ireland. You know, they could they could literally connect with them through you know one of the technologies. So if you're gonna if you as an American are gonna audition for those dialects, you better be on your game. Right. You have to really know what is the difference. I and mean, there's probably just like in America. Think about it. If, oh, if someone says do an American dialect, well, which one? There's so many. <laughs> Bronx, Queens, which version of the South? You know, Florida Southern or Tennessee or Alabama. Which version of Tennessee? Um, if you're gonna say East Coast. Oh my gosh, there's there's about, you know, 28 to pick from from May, you know, all the way down. Right. And even even if you say do a a non you know, just do a standard American. Well, what they sort of mean is California. Right. But it also can't have too much California and it. it has to kind of ride this middle ground. So, it's really fascinating. Well, that's I, I love that stuff. So. Oh, absolutely. I was, I was going to say, that's what uh, my, my parents and I have this discussion sometime. They're watching too. And um, we feel like growing up in, in Indiana, you know, actually, if you just went to the next county over from where I grew up, it was a very Southern accent, almost like a Tennessee or Kentucky accent. But we felt like, you know, where we grew up in the Midwest, it was kind of a very standard dialect, you know, as far as that goes. But it very, California sounds very similar to me, but there's a little bit of a difference. That's just, I don't know. That's a, a conversation we'd had before. So I don't know what, if you feel like the Midwestern dialect is 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 fairly similar to that or not no 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 okay. there's a lot of differences yeah Aha. but we don't need to bore your no no that's okay but it's, it's, it's here to learn about dialects it's, it's, it's oh, interesting yeah. though so that is something but it was when you said that i was like we have talked about that before so that's cool so we said we're, we're gonna do a whole voiceover one like it is we stuff. should we'll talk about that'll be awesome one. yes <laughs> awesome here excellent for Disney and for cartoons and animation yes. right absolutely <laughs> so okay so i think that is um I think that's everything on the uh, on the haunted mansion and on the uh, on all of the the Constance Hatchaway. So amazing! And, and I was gonna, I was going to mention too, by the way, the only other classic attraction that's had somebody added to it is Pirates, and that was Johnny Depp. So that's a you know it's a pretty you know you and Johnny Depp are the only actors really that have been added to a Disney attraction. That's pretty amazing, actually, a, a classic. I would think, right? It's been added to it. That's well, Barbosa. Oh, Barbosa. Yeah, that's true. Barbosa was, I guess, yeah. so Pirates, Pirates had a couple actors added. Yeah, they so. did. And then, of course, they, you know, they did the politically correct thing, changing out. The, um, but, but she's, I, I wouldn't call her redhead. someone. Yeah, I mean, no disrespect, Matt, right. because obviously it's an incredible job that they did, but I wouldn't call her like a major. No. She doesn't, I don't think she gets quite as much cosplay and fan art. And I can't believe the amount of amazing merchandise that's going on with the bride sometimes. It's oh, yeah. Like, I just did a private signing on on Friday, some of which had that that you know the charity part that I did, signing um, Funko Pops for charity, and oh. he was presenting me with merchandise I had never seen. Uh, that's you know clearly sold in a lot in Walt Disney World and probably also in Disneyland at this point. Right. I was just like, oh my gosh, there is so much merch associated with the bride at this point. It's, oh. it's amazing. I have my little. I was going to say, if you want to share this, people are asking about the Funko Pop, but that's pretty cool too. Oh, it's, it's, it's a mask, Constance. <laughs> She's a plushie and someone did this cute little that's cute. mask for her. <laughs> yeah. That is so awesome. And, and you mentioned uh, when we, when we chatted um, last, last night about the, when we were getting ready, we were talking about the Funko Pop there. You have some extras. So do you want to talk about that real quick? Um, we're, she's raising money for a, for a really, really great charity by, by selling these. And so this is all going to a really good cause. So if you want to talk about that. Right now? Well, sure. We're already talking about Constance. Why not? <laughs> I feel like now it's going to be a QVC commercial. No, it's okay. Um, well, the, the Funko Pops, of course, there's, there's two that have been, well, Technically, there's three that have been issued for the bride that I'm aware of. There was the one that was for the 50th anniversary, the blue, the blue one, where she looks true to sort of like how she appears in the attic. Um, and then there's the stretching room version of Constance, which came out, I think, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, that's since been vaulted, but is still somewhat available. And then they did a chase version of her on a slightly taller tombstone and a different axe or she's hmm. got an axe or something like that. Okay. Um, and so the the stretching room version of Constance, which is... 
that one. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that one. I was sent. Um, we'd we'd ordered some for the professional private signing that was on Friday, um, and the the reason that you do a private signing, by the way, y'all, in case like this is a new terminology, is it it allows them to properly verify and authenticate that it was in fact you who signed them. They take pictures of you signing. Um, sometimes you do video shout outs to specific people who've paid for that extra little you know, video shout out. This is me signing your pop. Um, and that way it's, it's you know, got, it holds its value more because it's proven. Now with someone like me, I kind of, you know, nicely roll my eyes and go, I don't think people are that concerned that it's really my autograph. But if it's someone like a Harrison Ford you care a lot. <laughs> that's actually his, you know, his autograph. So that's why they do them. And um, there's little certificates that verify. Anyway, long story short, I got extra, a few extra were left over. I think there were nine. Is that what I told you? There was about nine pops. I think so. Yeah, that's great. And um, I was like, well, I don't want to keep them because I'll lose them or accidentally I'll, you know, crush the boxes or something while I'm doing something in my office. So I was like, I just want to do something good with them. Maybe I'll donate them for charity. Oh, no, I'll sign them and I'll do them at a discounted rate and all the proceeds will go to charity. So we did this really cool drive all week, which you guys participated in as well. And Lilith Fury, Lilith, if you're watching, thank you for helping and supporting as well. And Bats Day, Noah, thank you. So all of them posted um, on their various platforms that I was doing this sort of charity event and we sold out of um, all of them and all of the proceeds went. So we raised over a thousand dollars to uh, for uh, no kid hungry, which is Jeff Bridges um, amazing charity. Jeff, who of course is uh, Flynn in right. John. Right. Yeah. So that's a wonderful charity. He started 25 years ago to feed American school children who could not afford, uh, you know, lunches. So important. And, it's so great. And they get to bring a box of food to their families once a week as well from a food bank. So it's, I love it because it's really geared towards kids who are really trying to better themselves and, and parents who are really trying to make sure that their kids have a, a chance, you know, outside of poverty um, to, to better themselves. And so it, it nourishes them and feeds them and, you know, stuff like that just really is near and dear to me. And everybody was so great. So we ended up accidentally with two extra pops that I discovered that I didn't know I had, which I told you about, yeah. I think like a day ago. I was like, so I have two more. <laughs> so actually people were asking in the chat already, like, how do I get one? How do I get one? So yeah, um, you can. I love you guys. <laughs> so basically it's really special. <clears throat> um, excuse me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> no, you're fine. I got passionate. <laughs> uh, if you just DM me on my Instagram, which is just Kat Cressida, um, or you can send me an email, which is uh, I think I think these are all in your right. They're on they're on the bottom of your uh, YouTube. If you posted yes, and the the mod moderators are posting the uh, the um, social media handles right now as well. So you can go DM her on Instagram. The links uh, Beaker and Honey do just posted it. Yep. Yeah, you could just and I'll it'll be in a hidden request first if we haven't if you haven't followed me yet it'll be in a hidden request. But I'll find them tonight. And basically, I do it first come you know first first paid. And it's really cool because what you get, and here's my QVC commercial. Yeah, I'm, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to make you full screen you so everybody can see it. Find Funko Pop um, done with the I do, I did. If you want your name on it, I include it. If you don't, that's fine. Um, and then you also get a picture of me signing your Funko Pop to authenticate that it was me doing it when in 20 years people are questioning it. And then a video shout out that you can post on your social media of me saying, hey, this is me signing your Funko Pop. And then we FedEx it out to you wherever you are in the United States um, or Hawaii or Alaska. Um, and uh, it arrives within three days of us FedExing. You get a you get your FedEx, a photo of your FedEx tab so you can track it. And yeah, that's awesome. and, it's, and it's way below cost of what it would cost, you know, but if you DM me. I, I share all the details in full transparency, but it's a great deal for a collector if if you're into those sorts of things. And anything that's not spent on, you know, the actual whatever, you know, FedEx goes right, right to the charity. 
right? So you're helping a good cause. And if you're a collector, it's a great opportunity. So yeah, definitely DM her and check that out. And we can remind everybody one more time at the end. And while we're on that, before we move on to the next really important thing, uh, definitely go follow her on Twitter. Even if you're not interested in the Funkos or interested in any of that kind of stuff, she uh, posts some amazing things on Twitter. Uh, a lot of really cool videos of Walt, things that I had, I'm a big Walt Disney history buff, and I had not seen a lot of these videos. We've been retweeting them on our Twitter, but if you're not on Twitter, Go on Twitter. You don't have to post anything on there. You can just make a, you know, make a an account. You can call it Mickey Mouse, whatever. It doesn't matter. But go on, the, go on there, make an account, and, and follow at Cat Cressida because she posts these every morning at about seven or seven thirty Eastern time, um, and it's like a two minute video you can watch while you're getting your coffee and breakfast in the morning, and it's great. So definitely go check that out, and also follow on Instagram. And when she gets these followers, this helps her also with her charity, her drive to help these awesome charities. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't know if you want to mention something about that real quick as well how how that helps your your charity causes by getting th those followers built up yeah do you think anybody's interested in this because I, I i'm so respectful of their time. oh no they're they're totally they're sunday evening okay we have the most respectful um, audience ever <laughs> uh, well disney walt's history and the imagineers history specifically how walt created mostly the park my my main focus is how he created disneyland and all of the planning that went into it for the 20 years leading up to the park being built in 55, but on also the Disney animated classics. So I kind of focus on those two. I think today is the anniversary of the Aristocats. So we have a really cool behind the scenes with the Sherman brothers on creating that. But um, I am very honored to have some relationships with some amazing Imagineers, people who actually were part of the early years of Imagineering, not Unfortunately, um, other than Bob Gurr, of course, right. there's very few people still are alive, God bless them, who work directly with Walt. So Bob's very special. And a few, you know, a few last remaining females, you know, Teresa and people who are around who did. But the people right after that, sort of in the 65 to 72 era, I'm very lucky to be friendly with some of those people. Um, I wouldn't call them friends. I'm very respectful. You know, mm -hmm. friends is someone that you hang out with, right? But friendly with having worked with, signed with them, and they will give me access to amazing footage, or let me know where I can find amazing footage. Um, sometimes it takes us several hours to locate that footage on the internet, and um, I'm very proud of this. But we create a little two-minute story. So, for example, the Olympic footage. Um, you know, the little Olympic one that went out on Friday about how Walt actually created the blueprint for how the Olympic opening ceremonies were going to be forever after. Right. And from the 1960 Olympics, that was actually several links um, that we seamlessly wove together and intercut with audio and pulled, you know, archival footage of Walt to kind of create that two minutes. Um, and we spend Sometimes I get obsessed. I'll spend, you know, three hours a day. My social media gal will roll her eyes. Like, yes, <laughs> she does get obsessive. Um, and I give very specific <clears throat> cues. But I want every day there to be some piece of Walt's legacy in our hearts, something true and something truly special and um, done in a way that you really get the feeling of what that's what that little story was kind of like right. how my dad had introduced me to to the attractions i think it's so important um it breaks my heart i speak at universities sometimes or i you know go to fan conventions and it breaks my heart that younger generations do not know the amount of artistry genius time energy intelligence in, in you know ingeniousness that went into every one of those classic attractions right and I mean, he changed so much beyond theme parks, obviously, but it's so, to me, it's so important to, to go and to have a piece of that and to understand it. So the next time you go on Jungle Cruise, you recognize that little Easter egg or you understand how many versions of that tiger it took and what they had to go through. I love that. I geek out on it, obviously. Oh, and, absolutely. And there's a reason that the Imagineering story was such a huge hit on Disney Plus. You know, people had not had access to that behind the scenes before. When it came out, it was so funny to have people saying to me, Kat, you've got to see this special. They're showing how they, I'm like, 
yes, I've been tweeting that out for three years. <laughs> <laughs> I've been showing that footage for three years, you know. Right. I get it. It is amazing. It is magical. And it it doesn't ruin the magic. It actually makes you appreciate it all the more. No, it enhances it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Well, so guys, definitely I, I see uh, Spaceship Ears, by the way, is on here. His dad had a role in the creation of Spaceship Earth here at Epcot. So uh, he worked with Imagineering as well. So he's talking about how important it is to preserve the legacy of, of all these talented Imagineers. It's so great. So, um, so yeah. Um, it's fun too. I mean, it's, yeah. I hate the word history. Like I, I use the, I use the hashtag Disney history all the time, but history is not to some people. And of course, history is invaluable because you can't get to where you're going without have, knowing where you came from. But right. Um, I don't like the word history because it sounds like it's a lesson. It's not that at all. It's a story. It's a little piece of magic every morning. And I'm so honored to be sent this amazing, rare, lost archival footage, which that nobody has seen before. Right. Or at least nobody outside of, you know, Imagineering. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, guys, definitely go follow uh, Kat on both Twitter and Instagram. And, again, somebody asked about the, the Funko Pops. There's only two of them right now. Uh, but if you're interested, again, you can go DM her on Instagram. Uh, or you can – I believe your email is cat at catcressida.com if they can't do the – if they don't have those social media. Yeah. So they can – I just well, I ask too. people to do both because that right. way if it goes to spam on my email, then at least I'll see your DM on Instagram. If it gets hidden for some bizarre reason by Instagram, I'll you know get your email. Yes. And it will be in order of whoever ends up paying the, the PayPal first. But absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys. Some, that, that means so much to me. Thank you. Yes. Somebody was asking about a Jesse Funko Pop uh, because I know you've 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 voiced uh, Jesse on a couple different occasions as well. I, I don't know. I think there's probably a Jesse Funko Pop somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm very honored without you know, I don't obviously I have nothing to do with what Funko Pops get selected. And I certainly have nothing to do with what voices I've been lucky enough to honored to voice. But I'm seven Funko Pops at this point, right? Which is really cool. There's Electra, you know, the Marvel Electra. Yep. Two versions of her. There's Jesse the Cowgirl. Three versions of the Bride. Dee Dee. Yes, Dee Dee. Who just dropped, which yep. I'm doing a giveaway for a charity giveaway in a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, really, it's an honor. I Absolutely. love it when people bring them up to fan conventions. It's like. Oh my God, it's so cute. They're so cute. They're so yeah. Cute. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. Well, so I want to make sure we get to this uh, very, very important uh, part of your story. And I was honored to um, to read. The, I put the, the link to the article and also the TED Talk in my uh, video description. So you guys can go check those out later to get more information. Um, <clears throat> but as you know, as we, as we talked about all evening, you know, Kat's passion is, is voice acting, uh, you know, dealing with using her voice. And, and she had, um, you know, a very unfortunate uh, event happen, and, she, you know, she was able to triumph over. And, and so uh, she wants to share her story of, um, you know, some, you know ins to inspire people that may be dealing with something similar. So Kat, if you could share your a little bit of your story with us, we would really, really appreciate that. Sure. Do you feel like the vibe is right to do that? Because again, I respect that you guys are here for magic. Oh no, I I think I think it's 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 inspirational to people for sure. Like I I, I watched the TED talk. To me, I was inspired, and and the you know reading the article, the interview um, with uh, the news article there, the that was you know the Daily News that was um, was inspirational to me because yeah, everybody has bad things happen to them, and and they're all on different levels and different you know ways that they come about. But uh, it's amazing to see you know how people triumph over it the strength of the human spirit i think it's really important okay um well i'll try to nutshell this so we can get back to you know some of the more up up really uplifting parts of this and again uh we'll probably end up doing a, a part two at some point of course there's so much we, ha we haven't talked about all the fun adventures of being a cast member Ooh, i have some devious stories from my time doing that <laughs> but um in unfortunately in 2012 uh during the summer right around fourth of july I had started to notice <clears throat> something not quite right going on in my jaw right here. And um, I was feeling it specifically when I was doing some of my voice matching, really opening my mouth wide, something just wasn't right. And um, I kept bringing it to doctor's attention. I'd, I'd even noticed it before, but they would sort of feel around and say, oh, it's probably just a little cyst. I wouldn't worry about it. And it's human nature. For the most part, when it comes to medical stuff, if a doctor, somebody in a white coat 
who clearly has all those degrees behind them says, I wouldn't worry about it. Part of us really wants to just take them at their word because who wants to deal with anything that could come after worrying about it, right? I mean, I'm as terrified of <laughs> anything medical as most people are, unless you're a doctor or a nurse. God bless you if you are, by the right, way. Right. Um, and I, I donate blood regularly. And even that kind of is a slightly frightening experience just to be around syringes and needles. Absolutely. But, um, so I went along with it for a while and then it became clear that something was up. And fortunately I was raised with enough awareness and some people are not, there's different cultures, certainly all throughout the United States, there's different, you know, ways of being raised where some people are very nervous about, you know, very concerned about health and other cultures uh, within America, not as concerned. It just really depends on what your family's vibe was like and what people focused on. And um, fortunately there was enough messaging as I was being raised of, if you feel like something's not right, go to a doctor. Don't put it off, don't procrastinate, force yourself to go. And I really do say that conscientiously because still to this day, I will have arguments with friends, usually men for the most part, but also females where they're like, eh, I'll wait and see if it gets any worse. And I'll be like, why? No, why don't do that. Why do you want to play, you know, Russian roulette with what could be, you know, the ability to live longer or be around your kids more or, you know what I'm saying? So um, anyway, I went, I forced myself to ask the difficult question and rather than being passive, I remember very specifically saying, I want to get to the bottom of what this is, even if it's uncomfortable or scary, which I remember, and these were all male doctors. This is before the Me Too movement. This is 2012. Unfortunately, I ran into a lot of marginalization that I wasn't prepared for. And marginalization means when that feeling of when someone puts you in a corner and says, they're there, I know better than you. Right. That they kind of push you off to the side and say, you know, your concerns aren't all that important or valid. You, It's a vibe more than anything. But a lot of male doctors were saying, I'm not feeling anything. Trust me, if it were X, Y, or Z, you'd be feeling differently. But a gut, there was something in my gut saying, it's not right. Something does not feel right. Inside and outside, it doesn't feel right. And sure enough, after insisting on several tests, and I do mean insisting, um, finally, a lab in Germany identified it as this very, very rare sarcoma. Um, a terrifying sarcoma, by the way, that is very malevolent. It hides in what essentially, if you picture like one of those gumballs that you get at a car wash, or a, a supermarket, you stick in the quarter, you get a nice big gumball. It's got the candy coated shell on the outside. Right. And on the inside is the chewing gum. That's the form that this sarcoma takes. On the outside, it's candy coated, meaning benign, nothing scary. Oh. On the inside, hidden inside is where the um, malignant tumor is. So it doesn't even show up on tests. How sneaky is that? Therefore, it's been misdiagnosed for several years and will literally, as one ages, that candy coating shell will melt and suddenly they've got brain cancer almost overnight. It's literally once that candy coated shell and it's usually around the age of 60. They said 60, 65, the body changes, you know, you mature, things change and that's when it tends to disintegrate. Right. I was the quote lucky one in one billion, some crazy odds, person who through whatever serendipity, they managed to identify it before it had done that. Mm. And I say, you know, lucky. I mean, how this was not a lucky story. Right. <laughs> but I suppose <laughs> if you're going to take the glass half full. So once we identified it, then um, as, as if that wasn't terrifying enough, it was where it was located underneath my brain so that it was hidden. You couldn't see it clearly. I couldn't get a clear angle on it. It was literally underneath my brain. And it was just, it was just there. And um, then the other part of my journey, which is I think in the article was that I got refused by most surgeons. Most surgeons didn't want to touch it. Right. They couldn't figure out how they would get to it without killing me. 
very dramatic. So um, I can smile about it now and laugh about it now, you know, and there's so much relief in talking about it. Of course, I have to keep myself from crying every time I really think too hard about it. But it was, I mean, when you talk about a game over moment, mm -hmm. moment, and I was so not prepared for it. And by that, I mean, I'd volunteered, I donated blood, I'd run for charity. I had family members who had been ill, but nothing prepared me for the diagnosis of you've got a rare one in a billion sarcoma underneath your brain that nobody wants to touch. And who knows how long you'll live right. if we can't get it out. So um, obviously that's not a comfortable diagnosis for anybody. And I got very lucky again, you know, say that with a grain of salt, but I got very lucky. And towards the end of 2012, on the six month journey since we discovered it with this lab in Germany, finally one amazing surgeon, Dr. David Alessi at, at Cedar sinai which if you don't know, is one of the two big hospitals, three big hospitals here in Los Angeles um, in, Ca in Southern California. He was the only one to say, I think I can get to it. And I think I can get to it without you being you dying in the process and us destroying your ability to speak and move your face. Cause that was the other part was because of where it was. Some doctors felt they could get to it, but I would never speak or move my face again. They'd have to sever, you know, the nerves. Right. So, yeah. um, it was obviously terrifying. Doesn't begin to define it. No. And, um, you know, that was 10 years ago. So I was 10 years younger and less mature. <laughs> so I did, did not handle this well. Um, I don't think anybody would handle that well. Maybe Gandhi. You know, I mean, <laughs> right. I, I, I think that, you know, that's the that's the reason for life lessons is hopefully you learn just enough to help you prepare for whatever else is around the corner. But yeah, I, I can't imagine. But I was even less prepared. I was just very carefree in a sense and not as... I'm going to use terms and I apologize. There's no mitigation meant to anybody, but I was not as deep or caring about those things. I, I thought I was a really caring person. Hindsight. I, you know, did my charity work. I donated blood. I raised money, sold Girl Scout cookies. You know, I did all these things that I thought made me involved, but I wasn't really connecting to it or getting involved. I wasn't really letting it in or, or, you know, letting it touch me in a way where I could compassionately really connect to people who were suffering, if that makes any sense. Right. Even having had family members who I mourned, you know, who had passed away, it, I had a younger mentality and it really was um, a life lesson on so many levels about you don't know when you meet somebody, it could be the most cheerful, upbeat person. And they may have gone through the most dreadful circumstances and you just can't take for granted what anybody's journey has been. And hopefully nobody ever goes through a version of anything like what I went through. Um, it took, it took many years to get right. It's um, unlike the movies where you can uh, fade cross fade to three years ahead. Right. In real life, it's not that you are suffering through every moment of the healing process. And, um, to be very candid, there were moments, of course. I mean, I was, you know, in my uh, early, yeah, I just turned, I think I just turned 30, 39 to 40. I literally was um, begging the the surgeon, if I, if I won't ever speak again, don't wake me up. Mm. Like very dramatic, very, you know, please, I don't want to live if I can't do voiceover. I'm glad he didn't <laughs> right. listen to me. But I also couldn't imagine waking up and being told the good news is we saved your life. The bad news is you will never do voiceover again. So. Um, and, and you can't, you can't see the chat, but there are just so many great messages of support here and just tons of people posting hearts in the chat. Uh, their very amazing story. It says, thank you for sharing your story. Um, that's almost like a piano player losing his or her hands. Very terrifying. Yeah. So a lot of people, very supportive messages. So hopefully you can go back and watch the replay and see some of these, uh, these messages people are leaving because they're very kind. I, well, I thank you guys. And the reason that we're sharing it, of course, is, and again, there's, there's so much more to the story. And that's, that's part of the lesson is that even if somebody tells you what they went through, 
believe it that there's parts that they're not sharing or there's parts that you won't ever really know because no and first nobody even had a manual how this was going to go that's the crazy part about it was that and not that you would ever want to get a diagnosis for any version of any disease but relatively speaking there were so many times i secretly had the thought of i wish it was this or i wish it were that because mm. at least it was a road map right they figured out through medical science how to get from point a to m in my case it literally was we kept walking into walls and figuring it out and uh, i'll i'll rip this off like a band-aid just to get through it so people i hope um feel comfortable with the story or at least um yeah just the, the truth of it was um, I was legitimately deformed for the first few months because to do what they had to do. And I had miracle surgeons putting me back together, but he wanted to do it the right way. And the right way is not the Western medicine way of, of putting it all back together with scotch tape. And then there's scarring. He wanted it to on its own organically fill back in. Mm. So it was quite terrifying. I mean, I literally was deformed for a while and quarantined, legitimately quarantined, you know, for not COVID quarantined, but we don't want you to catch anything or, um, you know, risk marring any of the surgery or the stitches. Um, for a while I couldn't eat and they, they temporarily paralyzed me for the surgery. They literally um, injected something into my face to create paralysis so that during the surgery, I wouldn't accidentally twitch right. and, and, because they were using like tiny, tiny knives and they didn't want me to accidentally, you know, just subconsciously twitch and ruin what they were doing. So to come out of, to, to thaw out of that paralysis took several months. Wow. And even then I had to relearn how to speak again after that, because that had been in you know, been inactive for so long. So I had to relearn to speech therapy, how to talk. <laughs> wow. So that was the journey. And I know, I know you and I, Josh, you were wonderful. We, we talked about whether or not we should share it. And of course it's out there. There's art, beautiful articles written about it. And then I was honored to do the follow-up Ted talk about what it's like to come out of deep trauma back into life. And I just want people to feel somewhat comforted. Um, first of all, believe it, whatever you may have to face, believe it that a, probably somewhere someone has been ahead of you experienced it and somehow navigated it and somehow gotten through it even if you can't find the story on google it probably has been navigated somewhere which means that if you research or look for the help or keep searching for the right surgeon you will find them um hopefully in most diagnosis right. and I know that there's some you know God willing, I know there's still some diagnosis uh, for some diseases that have not been obviously fully uh, navigated yet, but probably there's some hope out there of finding a roadmap. Second, I hope in some small way, and I mean this not at all with any ego, <laughs> but I hope and look, because it wasn't me that put me back together. It was some amazing surgeons, but I hope that it gives some hope. If you, if you or someone you love are going through a terrifying diagnosis where there doesn't seem to be a tomorrow, that um, you can hopefully find a way that there are sometimes ways to get there. And I'm not, I'm not here to sugarcoat it. I right. really, when you hit those times, they're devastating. It's called circumstantial depression. There's a term. Um, natural, natural depression that comes by circumstance, the death of a loved one. Um, or grief, you know, a breakup that's particularly painful or a diagnosis to something you weren't expecting. It's okay to be sad, depressed, lost, scared, terrified, you name it, fill in the blank. It's okay. Right. And don't judge yourself. Just try to gently nudge yourself a teeny bit forward to not give up. I hope Absolutely. that came up. No, that, that, that was perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. I was going to say on a smaller scale, I had a surgery last year and, uh, nothing like that, but, but you know, there was, there was still, it was a surgery. It was, it was, I guess they told me later it was considered major surgery because of what they had to do, but, um, there was a chance that I wouldn't make it. And just thinking about, you know, making, I made a video for my son just in case and just that kind of stuff, you know, that, that 
you know, just having those thoughts and, and that did bring about a depression because I was like, okay, but what happens? There's all these things I still want to do. So I totally, you know, get my recovery was nothing like yours was, but, but those feelings are, you know, it's, it's scary. So for sure. Yeah, very valid. And of course the world, uh, you know, ironically, I did an article for Forbes magazine, literally the month that COVID hit. And he said, like, I wanted to cancel it. I didn't want to do it, even though it was such an honor, you know, Forbes magazine. Wow. But I said, this just feels inappropriate. Like, I don't want to talk about me right now and what I went through when the whole world is suffering. Right. He felt it was important because maybe it would give people a feeling of feeling less alone in the isolation that was hitting everybody at that time. Um, so it's, it's been a, it's been a journey. And that's why all the, you know, that's why the charities are particularly important to me, because if you're lucky enough (laughs) to come back from stuff like that, hopefully you have more of a lens of it's not just me suffering. You know, one of the most, I'll just one more thing and then, and then we'll get on to something much more cheerful. I hope for all of us, for all our sakes, but I was, if anybody's ever gone through, Uh, cancer treatment or had a family member, you know that radiation is not what you think it is before you've ever done it. It's a very intense waiting game. You show up, you sit there for several hours waiting for your slot and they keep moving your slot because they take more serious cases ahead of you every morning. And fortunately, you know, I have to say this, it wasn't a serious case at that point. I had made it right. I, my diagnosis was, yay, she's, she's alive and she's going to live. So they understandably take cases that are far more uh, serious. And um, I was in pain, I was depressed. This was still not whole, but I had to go every morning for radiation. And I would sit across from families, moms and dads and little kids, little kids going through treatment and it would break my heart. I was... I couldn't believe that I had to sit in the same waiting room with somebody going through what they were going through and everybody act like we're just waiting for the dentist. It's kind of a bizarre, surreal situation. And you don't want to make small talk. That just feels disrespectful. You don't want to be rude and address, you know, call the yellow. It's just a, what do you say? Right. So you would sit there silently, respectfully, and you'd know in your heart that that little seven-year-old probably was fighting for their life. Mm. And I just had so many thoughts like, please, God, if I get through this, let me get through this so I can do something, something, anything, something. And I probably don't, you know, still don't do nearly as much as could be done. But to me, it's so important to try to help families who are dealing with that. Sorry, you guys. No, (laughs) that was absolutely spot on. And and I'm so... I'm so glad you shared that because, you know, I think we talked, we talked, you know, about charity work and we talked about why the social media is important and all those things. But guys, you can see very clearly now why she's so passionate about this, why she wants to do good through her social media, even, you know, something as small as, as selling the Funko Pops and the proceeds go to charity or, you know, trying to become, you know, trying to get the, the following built up so that she can, you know, be an ambassador for some of these charities. You know, this is, it's, it's really important and valuable work and, and it, you know, it's going to help somebody and she's got a voice and a platform that she can use and she wants to use it. So I think, you know, anything we can do, if we can just go over there and follow those social medias, Twitter, Instagram, any of that stuff, go follow it. Uh, it takes three seconds and, and, and you're helping, you know, you're going to be helping somebody out in ways you may not even know. Yeah. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Let's, let's talk about something cheerful. Yes. We, oh, the Ted talk, by the way, was a huge honor. And I will say, I don't know if anybody's into Ted talks, but they are really amazing that the Ted organization is amazing because it's supposed to be, of course they have celebrities too, but it's supposed to be ordinary people who went through extraordinary circumstances with a unique lens, right. a, a slightly different lens on life. And it was such an honor to do that that eight minute. And they're not supposed to be about what you went through. That's the other weird thing about them is it's like, okay, we got you because you have a unique lens, but talk about how you're going to use that lens to better the world. Right. That's literally what a TED Talk is. And that was such an honor to, mm. to get to do that. And um, I won't say it was fun, 
because it was a, a scary, scary rehearsal process, but it was such an honor. Absolutely. You guys yeah. are awesome. Let's Absolutely. Talk Disney. Yes. Yeah. People, um, Sorry, I just wanted to thank. I've got Incor Sports said it just hit me how many times Resort TV One has provided hope in infinite ways, though equally infinite stories like cats. Thank you so much, Incor Sports. That's awesome. This is this is exactly why when when Kat and I talked about this and she said, Is it okay to share that? Absolutely. I'm so glad that you did because it's so important. And there may be somebody out there listening right now that needed to hear that. And I think that that makes it, you know, a hundred percent uh important to share. So that's so great. Awesome. Thank you for saying that. Absolutely. And so guys, um, you know, going kind of back into the, into, you know, her, her amazing talent side of things and, and all of her, her work, um, we haven't really talked, um, I know we can talk more about your, your the characters you voiced or, you know, we, we probably don't have time to get too much into the sports. I know you've done a lot of that. And I think we can, we talked about doing video games maybe next time. So, um, I'm trying to think if there's any other questions. Oh, I, I've got one right here. Okay. Here, here's, here's one. So. What if you were to be added to another ride at Walt Disney World? And this is just theoretical, but um, you know, what would you like to be added to, and why, or, or what character? Just just off the top of your head, if you've got anything. I mean, honestly, I'm not meaning to sound falsely. Um, what's the word? You know, when celebrities are like, you know, I just want to thank everyone. I, I'm not meaning to sound fake when I say. I think, I, I mean, what more could I ask? <laughs> that's so true. No, that's so true. I mean, first of all, I don't, be, this is going to sound odd, but it's the truth. And anybody who now knows my history understands why. I don't really believe in changing the classic attractions. Right. Or they're, they're classic for a reason. <laughs> I think the Imagineers got them right. So um, I really... You know, there's that famous, there's that famous quote, which I just quoted for the circus, you know, thing that went out, uh, the circus history that went out yesterday. Um, Walt had said, you know, Disneyland will never be completed as long as there's imaginations. What he meant by that was not we're going to keep messing around with something we've gotten right. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> I'm very a firm believer there's certain things that should not have been changed or monkeyed with. I won't say specifically what, but I feel very passionately that if the Imagineers got it right, you leave it alone. Now, that's not <laughs> to say you don't up, improve the technology so it works better, doesn't sure. be breaking down. Um, there's certainly minor things that one should tweak. And, you know, heck yes. If something is no longer appropriate um, culturally, and I'm not going to get specific, but if something is no longer culturally acceptable, address it. Sure. Let's not pretend that we're back in 1955 and we're that ignorant. Right. And I and I mean that. Let's let's be respectful of people's cultures, heritages, um, backgrounds, upbringings, whatever that is. So do what it takes to make it right. That being said, if something is not politically incorrect or hurtful to anybody then um, why, why change it? So I, that's, that's the answer to that. I love that. It's out there. But um, that being said, there's that, oh, I wish I had been around in 1955 or 1960 to record those. There's those attractions where it's like, oh my God, what a dream come true that would have been to be a part of that. But there's a reason, you know, those people are amazing. Of course. Those people are incredible. I think here's another little bit of trivia that I think is worth shouting out, which most people don't think about until I say it out loud and they go, oh my God, you're right. Growing up in the parks, I grew up again in the late, mid to late seventies was my, when I was a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, my formative years in the parks. What were the voices I was hearing? What were the amazing Disneyland voices I was hearing with one exception? What gender were they? Hmm. Anybody? <laughs> Come on. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, they. It's not they a trick were, question. Yeah, it's not a trick question. I mean, yeah, they would. They probably would have been mostly male, I guess, right? They were all male. Yeah, all it's... of the great voices you heard, and that's partly because it was being historically accurate. Um, but even narrations in the park, even all the in park narrations. Absolutely. Absolutely, safety spiels. Right. Almost, almost without bar until the the mid to late sixties, all male voices, and. You know, let's call it for what it was. It was chauvinism. The 50s were chauvinistic. Um, I hope that's not offending anybody. Oh, no. 
but you know, historically speaking, for being accurate, it was very chauvinistic. And so even as a child in the 70s, the voices of authority, the voices of storytelling, the voices of magic were for the most part all men that I was hearing in the park. And I was tape recording them when I was in college doing as a theater major, I brought a little one of those little carry tape recorders, cassette tapes. And I was recording them. And it even then it didn't occur to me. Right. Nobody said out loud, how interesting that all of the voices that you admire are all male voices. And, you know, the tiki's, the tiki birds, right. uh, Jungle Cruise. I when I became a cast member, I remember this moment of like it was like a woke moment. The first time I took being in college. I went to UC Berkeley, go Bears, by the way, <laughs> Blue Stanford. Um, it was a friend of mine who I dragged into applying to be a cast member with me, Scott, who lived in my dorm. I dragged him with me because I didn't want to be alone going through the whole cast member um, interview process. And he was like reluctant. He was like, yeah, I guess I could spend the summer working at Disneyland. I was like, come on, it'll be so great. He wasn't a Disney geek or anything. I get in hindsight, he must have had a crush on me. Why else would he have applied without <laughs> wanting to work at the park? But anyway, Scott and I applied. I said I really wanted to do something live, interactive with guests. And the only time at that time really was to either be in entertainment, which I wasn't talented. I wasn't a dancer, so I couldn't do that. I couldn't be a princess. Um, and uh, storybook land. So I applied for that and I got lucky and I got it. Scott got my dream job, which was Jungle Cruise Skipper. Jungle Cruise. I was going to say that's the other big one. Jungle I Cruise Skipper. I wanted to shoot hippos. I wanted <laughs> to make sarcastic jokes. I wanted to tell. I wanted. And I'm telling y'all, this was in the 90s. I was not allowed. Mm. They did not let women. You know, women did not shoot hippos. Women did not shoot guns. Women did not wear pants. And, you know, hmm. there you go. So I had to wear the little culottes. And be a cute little storyteller on story, which I loved. I mean, it was. I there's a actually a picture right here. You can see it. Let me pull it up full screen here. There we go. Perfect. Oh there's yeah, me. that is so cool. Not fun. That is so cool. Um, I, I pulled it out just in case this came up. But Scott, when we got back to the doors, I'm like, what? Did, what'd you get? Are you doing food? Are you doing retail? Because that's what he said he wanted to do. Right. He's like, oh, I'm going to be a skipper on the, the, he's got it wrong too. He said, I'm going to be a skipper on the jungle boats. Jungle boats. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, screw you. You didn't even uh, want it. <laughs> that is so funny. Well, and you got, of course you got the iconic skippers. Uh, what was it? Um, of Steve Martin. And I think uh, it was Robin Williams one, I think, or some of those guys got their start, not Robin Williams, but Steve Martin was for sure. Steve Martin was not on the jungle cruise. Was Steve it, he Martin. worked at the magic shop. Yeah. Who, okay, who was, but so one of those guys was on the Jungle Cruise. Somebody let There's me know. There's been a couple of, yeah, male celebrities. I can't remember who they are, but a couple of them. John Lasseter, somebody said? Okay, I guess maybe John Lasseter was in there. Um, I don't know. People are posting in the chat. But yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. So anyway, cool. That Yeah, that's 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 really cool. And that, and you said, actually, when we were talking to you as we were getting prepared for this, that that was really one of the first times that you kind of fell in love with voice acting, right? As, as you were telling those stories or kind of started thinking about it, I think you mentioned. Um, it was... No, I said it was my first, ironically, it was my first voiceover job. But no, I didn't even put two and two together. Okay. I think there was going to be, that wasn't ever on my radar of something that you could do. Interestingly enough, you'd think that it would have occurred to me. Well, and loving, when you're at, you know, that, just so. what in college at the time, probably not thinking, you know, about that in that same mindset. So that's pretty interesting for sure. So, yeah, I mean, thinking about acting and that's what I trained in, but, but I did not know enough. I wasn't educated enough about Hollywood to really think about so stupid. Like I loved the Disney anime classics, why it never occurred to me. Probably because my whole family wasn't, there was nobody in the arts or encouraging the arts. I grew up in a very sort of, um, you know, schooling was important, degrees were important, be a lawyer, be a doctor, be an accountant. Right. Nobody was thinking entertainment. So I don't think I had a lot of thought process towards that side of the industry, but that was my first voiceover job. I got in trouble a lot, y'all. Like I I loved going off script. You're not supposed to go off spiel, but I, because I loved the Disney stories and I'd grown up listening to those records over and over and over again. I remember I got in big trouble once because, um, you, you know, they changed things. I hope this doesn't shock anybody, but sometimes things get tweaked for the Disney. Of course. You know, the Disney universe. And this is back, this is in the nineties. 
So um, in Disneyland at the time, I haven't been on Storybook Land for a long time, although I still remember my whole opening spiel. And when I have a margarita, sometimes I can still do the entire, oh no, Monstro. But um, <laughs> there was a little island on our right as we would pass the three pigs and Alice on our left. Right. There was the, uh, the little island that was supposed to be, they called it London Park. Okay. With the statue of Peter Pan. I don't know if it's still there. Anybody know? It might be. I've got a video of a video of it on the channel. I'll have to check it out after the after the interview. <laughs> so okay. they would call it in the Disney spiel again in the nineties, and I hope this doesn't get me in trouble, but this is a long time ago. They would call it London Park. Um, and they would say, you know, and there's the little park that Wendy and Michael and John and Peter flew over on their way to Never Never Land. That's London Park, where the famous Peter Pan statue is. And the, and the statue that they had was a little gold statue, and it was of the Disney model of Peter Pan. <laughs> you know, the <laughs> Disney version of Peter Pan. Right. And me being like the historically accurate UC Berkeley history major, we would go buy it, and I would say, and there's Kensington Gardens, and, uh, and there's the Disney version. You know, so I would change it so that it was historically accurate, and I got in big trouble. Oh, that's funny. So you you were changing it not not to make a joke, but to actually make it more accurate. <laughs> that's so yeah. funny because a lot I of don't know why. Yeah, that was so important. To no, me. I I think that yeah, it, especially when you're in college and when you're learning those things, I think that is it does become important to people for sure. So, <laughs> no, I I get that for sure. I I was I, I was kind of like a pink slip for doing that. Oh well, I'm glad that you didn't. <laughs> no, I did. Oh, you did. Oh yeah. Oh my. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, I was going to ask, speaking of, um, let's see, here we go. Speaking of Disney, though, in the Disney culture, uh, somebody had a great question here. Um, so knowing the history of Walt and its legacy and all the things, of course, that you're posting on Twitter, um, you know, when did you first truly understand the Disney culture, maybe through some of your dad's stories or, or, or you know, that how the Disney was just different, that Walt's way of doing things was different? Like, when did you first understand that? And what does that really mean to you? No, I grew up with that. I mean, that's that's what made it so unusual was that because of his passion for Imagineering, I grew up literally always knowing that um, what Walt had created was unique, special, and understanding why it was so special. That was my dad's agenda was apparently that I would always have that lens on. Like going, I remember going backstage to the Tiki room, seeing the reel-to-reels back when they were reel-to-reels. I remember him explaining to me and to you know to a seven or eight year old you don't really get everything but right. i did get that what he was trying to say was that the way that the birds moved was notches in the tape hmm. right. and that it was kind of like a player piano i remember him saying you know how on a player piano the reason that it, it's got all those little bumps is that it's reading and it's triggering one of those notes right so it was the same theory it's going to be like a player plan, a player piano. And as it goes, those little notches create a little movement in the birds. So I, <laughs> yeah, that's... I don't know many seven year olds who are being taught that it was quite a unique uh, perspective. So I always knew that. And my dad, of course, very charming, very storyteller ish would tell other people online. The lines were quite long back then. Uh, they didn't have uh, no fast passes, right? you know? So um, I remember us standing for what seemed like hours, you know, on certain lines with my dad telling all these great stories to other people and feeling quite proud. <laughs> I knew, you know, why the shades of color on the candy store were three different shades of green. Right. You know, all this crazy stuff. Things nobody, yeah, nobody would think of. That's, you know, but, but I think a lot of people, you know, that are true Disney fans really appreciate that kind of stuff and that just the, the level of detail that goes into those things. And, you know, so that's, I think, uh, I think a lot of people really do appreciate that. And, and like, yeah, like you said, you really did grow up with it. There was no question, I'm sure, then with that kind of an upbringing about the Disney magic and the Disney quality. Yeah. So um, I know we're probably getting close to the end here, but um, maybe, if anybody out there is interested uh, just briefly about getting into like voice acting, uh, what would be your like advice to them as far as what they should do, um, you know, to get to kind of just get involved with that or, or, you know, follow their passion if that's something they're interested in. Is that what people are asking about right now? No, I just, uh, I don't know more about Disney. <laughs> no, well, let me see here. Um, 
Okay, guys. Because we're gonna do we're gonna do a whole other. Th that's true. That's true. You're right. Yeah. Let me see. Um, are there any other questions, guys? Real quick, any other questions? Uh, I'm looking to see if I missed any. About any of the things that I've that I've done. Yeah. That made me from Disney that you're curious about. I'm scrolling up here here to make sure I didn't miss anything. Or anything we you, Josh, here. wanted to touch on that we haven't yet touched on today. Um. Okay, so. You know, okay, I'll tell you the most magical experience I had as a cast member. Yes, please do. Okay. Most magical experience as a cast member was what they called the canoe races. And this is back when um, Tom Sawyer Island was still Tom Sawyer Island. It was open. Fort Wilderness was open. And they hadn't yet made it into Pirate's Lair. So it was the original Walt Disney with all the caves and bridges and right. tunnels, all the things that they eventually closed. It's so heartbreaking. We still have the cemetery at the back um, and the fort with the guns. And everything. So um, it was beautiful. And it was astonishing that we were allowed to do this, but we had canoe races. We had to show up. <laughs> we had to show up at the park at approximately 4.30 in the morning, 4 wow. to 4.30 in the morning. So it's still dark out. And that's very magical. You know, you walk down Main Street and everything's still on, but you're by yourself and you go straight, you'd go straight to um, frontier land. You'd find your boat, your crew. And we literally were racing, you know, the canoes around. And the that's back when the when the cabin was still on fire. Yep. That was still going on the settler's cabin. Oh yeah. And it was this, I can't describe how magical it was. Like, yes, it's make-believe. Yes, Tom Sawyer Island is completely man-made, but it looked so real. And you're doing it right at dawn, right as the sun is rising. And it just, you know, real meshes with make-believe. And you really felt for those magical 20 minutes to 45 minutes that you were back in 1860 or whenever that's supposed to be. Oh, yeah. Shame on not knowing when Tom Sawyer was supposed to be, but back in the 18 somethings. And you really believed it because you're in a canoe. Right. <laughs> um, and you're racing and you're all screaming and laughing and getting soaking wet. We sucked, by the way. My team was called Don't Rock the Boat. We were terrible. <laughs> um, we never won. Our goofy was our mascot. Oh, that's but, so funny. Um, that was, I can't, never in my life will something feel quite that vividly magical. And I remember actually having that thought, which is quite extraordinary for, you know, essentially a teenager. I remember right. thinking, this is time travel. Yeah. I just, I, I'm really vibing it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's over it's and then of... you have to, you know, change into, go to your locker and change right. into your costume. It's kind of a meta moment there when you realize that this is kind of a special moment in a moment there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have that realization. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm sorry, someone had a question. No, you're fine. That was that was awesome. I I I got the picture in my mind very vividly on that one. So that's cool. Um, somebody, uh, so Spaceship Ears, who um, again, his dad worked with uh, with the Spaceship Earth Project. He wants to know: Did you ever meet uh, the original Haunted Mansion Imagineers, Raleigh Crump, Mark Davis, or Claude uh, Coates? Did you ever meet any of those gentlemen? No. Um, near misses, almost. I feel. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Mark Davis. I think I'm telling the truth that I think that I met him briefly with my father. Um, because back then when he was working intersecting, sometimes I feel like um, some of those original people were discussed and that I met them, but I don't have a memory of them. Um, I've been honored to do a few events with Bob Gurr, of course, you know, he's in a stratospheric other level. Yes, and um, by. by the way, and by the way, I'm just going to say this because it, it it matters to me to say this. Thank you guys for the beautiful comments you sent me, but I am not a Disney legend. Please, let's keep that for the people who really, really earned that, who created the park, who are legends or did something extraordinary with the culture. Um, and I just say that in, in all respect, people think I'm being modest. No, Bob Gurr, that's a legend. Tony Baxter, that's a you know, these people are legends for a reason. Right. And I've been deeply honored to be at some events with them, a few Haunted Mansion events with Bob, some mm. Disney conventions. And um, it's extraordinary 
just to be in their presence just feel like oh right they're they're they're, they were part of it they built it they did it and um i met um alice davis a number of times at um the Tama Shanter restaurant, which is was Walt's watering hole back in the day in Los Angeles. If y'all ever come out to, and here's, I'm going to go on a rant for two seconds. <laughs> You're going to have to go in five minutes, but here's my rant. If you are one of those people that every year you plan to go to Disney World, flip the script for once, come out to Disneyland for once. Yep. Because it is very different. And it yes, it is true. You cannot spend two weeks at it. That's okay. It's Southern California. There's a million other amazing, beautiful things to see in Southern California. I agree. And I love, I live here. I agree. I live in Florida and I agree with you. I love coming to Disneyland. You have to. I mean, there are still parts of it that are breathtaking because they are what Walt created. And right. I no disrespect to anybody and their legacy and their love of Walt Disney World. That's another argument for another time, but it's Walt's park, right? There is a, there's a vibe to it and a feeling, and it is in many ways, don't get mad at me, far more magical because of that, because he specifically walked those steps and created things to be a certain way. Oh, absolutely. I, I always have that thought when I walk through the castle, the back of Sleeping Beauty Castle, and I, that iconic picture of Walt walking through by himself. That's one of my favorite pictures of Walt. Uh, there's a picture of him as he's walking through the back of the castle just before park open, I think. And I always think of that, like he was right here, like in that spot. I don't know. I just, it, that yeah. always hits me every time. You walked, you walked all of it except yep. for Star Wars land. Yeah. <laughs> and that was probably some kind of a backstage area, I'm sure at some point or something. It was, but, yeah. But yeah, so yeah. Um, that is so cool. Um, and let's see here. So let's see if I, I missed any other ones because there were a couple really, really cool questions here, but we can get to some of these next time if we need to. But um, okay, so on... Um, Okay, so somebody said, what kind of cues are you given for a scene uh, when you did t some Toy Story stuff, the Jesse the Cowgirl? Like, what kind of cues are you given when you're recording to help you know how to read them? The direction. Um, well, when it's a voice match, for the most part, the first, the first direction, of course, and the first focus is always on if it's a match. If you're right. getting, if, it, if you've created the audio illusion that it really is... Um, Joan Cusack's amazing voice. So that's usually the first thing that we're focusing on is, are we in the pocket for that? And what has to be adjusted to, to get it more in the pocket? And then and then the next directions are whatever the emotion is that she's supposed to be for doing those. Right. If okay. that's the question. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I had this question a few times throughout here and feel free to, uh, you know, feel free to say no, but a couple of people wanted to hear you do the Haunted Mansion bride voice, but if you're not allowed or if you're not warmed up, like, don't worry, but I just wanted to throw that out there. So you don't have to. Yes. We're supposed to preserve the match. Okay. That's what I thought. So I wanted to make sure, but I want to make sure people knew I wasn't ignoring that question. So I, I understand why people would want to do that, but if you want to hear it, go ride the ride <laughs> so <there you> go. <laughs> <laughs> or watch the video. Either way, cool. That that's what that's what I thought. So I, I agree with you. We got to preserve the magic. So excellent. Um, okay, so really quick one. Is there any um, were, were there any uh, any celebrities that you've worked with, um, other amazing actors or actresses that you were starstruck by? That I've worked with. Oh my god, yes. I mean, I think you mentioned a couple to me when we talked before this. Yeah, uh, when I was for the three years that I was doing on <clears throat> camera before I. Uh, you know, decided to go into voiceover. I was so honored and and lucky as heck to luck out. And I was on diagnosis murder twice. Um, there is I I pulled the picture. I got to go find this picture. It's hilarious. Yeah. But um, uh, I did an episode of diagnosis murder. Well, two episodes. But on one of them, I play a pregnant young. 20 something year old this is back again when i first started on camera and it was it was a special it was a very special episode it was one of those where there was a bombing um that happens and you know as luck would have it you know he's a surgeon he's a doctor and he's he's there in the restaurant when it got bombed i think it was a restaurant i don't remember the plot at all all i remember is that we spent hours with me on the floor it was supposed to be of course that stereotypical is she gonna 
she's going to have to deliver her baby maybe any moment now right. because she can't get to the hospital. And, and I didn't, I didn't give birth in the episode, but it was that kind of a scenario where he's with me down on the floor trying to make sure that I'm well. And of course, when you shoot on camera, you spend hours sometimes um, while they're figuring out cameras, moving set pieces, moving lights, rewiring. So um, I spent a lot of time on that floor of that diner set with Dick Van Dyke. Oh, and yet, wow. And yes, he tells every story you hope that he will. Every, every rumor you've ever heard about him, he is the loveliest, kindest, nicest, sweetest human being in the world. Mm. No ego. And occasionally, this is... We didn't have, this is like before cell phones, y'all. Right. <laughs> I wish to God I had had cell phones. I did get some pictures though taken with him, but he would occasionally step up and stretch and soft shoe and sing songs from Mary Poppins, just like to himself, <laughs> not not to anybody. He'd just kind of get up and da 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 everybody. Nobody would be paying attention to him because they were used to it. The right. whole crew was used to this. I was like. I would have been doing the same thing. Oh, my goodness. I mean, what do you. It was like. Yeah. Is anybody else seeing this? Because this is unbelievable. <laughs> um, and I was wow. probably. This is a, this is a sad truth, too. Um, when I did these, it was in the. Um, God, someone can probably look up my IMDb and tell me when it is, but I feel like it was 93, 94. That, sound, that sounds about right. Me, social, okay, internet, not what it is today. Social media, non-existent. So young people's understanding of who Dick Van Dyke was back then was not what it is now. Okay, um, he wasn't yet, I don't think a Disney legend. Maybe he was, but you know what I'm saying? It was right. like- People, of course, diehard fans knew, of course, Disney fans knew, but we were on a set with a bunch of actors who probably could care less about Mary Poppins, right. too young to really understand its legacy or understand who Dick Van, Van Dyke was, and, and too young to certainly know the Dick Van Dyke show or Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. So, you know, that was, it's kind of surreal to look back on that. Now, of course, it's changed. Now everybody in the world is a Disney addict. Everybody's got Disney Plus. Everybody knows these characters. It was not like that in the 90s. Right. Um, in fact, it wasn't cool to love Disney if you were, um, you know, over the age of 25. Yes, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but to me, it was amazing. And we talked about it. I, of course, I asked him questions, you know, what was it like? And... He was amazing. And then the other amazing surreal experience was working with Angela Lansbury um, on the back lot of wow. Universal Studios. We were shooting Murder, She Wrote. It was the last season. It was the season that her character, Jessica, moves to New York from Cabot Cove or wherever she was. Right. Did I get that right? I'll be I, impressed if my brain just that say, It sounds right. I haven't seen that for a long time, but it sounds right. Yeah. And, um, and I walked up to her at one point. Um, you know, I think I must have been 27 or something. And I walked up right up to her and said, I'm just feel so honored to be working with you, Miss Lansbury. Thank you for this tremendous honor. And she said exactly what you would hope she would say. Oh, dearie, you know, it's such a pleasure. You know, she's like, <laughs> hey, she's so love. I'm not going to try to imitate her, by the way. She was so lovely. And was I comfortable? Did I have everything I needed? Because it was her show. She exec produced it. She wanted to make sure everybody was always happy. Right. And to be in scenes with her, acting scenes with her, I mean, she's obviously done a lot more than bed knobs and broomsticks. Uh, and before, I don't, am I correct? And yeah, Beauty and the Beast, I think. Was mid 90s, right? Was is she at mid 90s, I think? I'll have to look that up. It had already come out. Oh, it had, okay. Yes. Anybody? I'll look Beauty it up. I'll, I'll, I'm going to look it up okay. right now because have, we have to know. Oh, it's, pretty it's, sure. Yeah, pretty sure that it had already come out. Okay. Oh, it, it's showing right. the, uh, okay. 1991 is the original. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. it was after that. It would have been two or three years after that, that I spent time with her, but I didn't, interestingly enough, being a Broadway baby, like I was, I, we mostly talk about Sweeney Todd. If anybody's a yeah. Sondheim fan. Um, cause she was the original, you know, yeah. this is love. Right. So, 
Oh my goodness. What and just I mean even, you know, Disney fans of course know her, you know, from like you said uh but also, you know, the the iconic voice of Mrs. Potts. I mean, like we said Beauty and the Beast, but it's that's her voice was so iconic in that role um and and the murder she wrote and everything else, but but yeah, that's that's just that's incredible. <laughs> to spend time and, and those are priceless experiences. I'm sure you were, were aware at the time that, you know, you're, you're meeting with people that are literally, Amazing. I mean, the act, not just Disney legends, acting legends. Oh yeah. Amazing that I got that lucky. And I didn't, it's not like I did that much. I mean, I have a decent handful of credits for being, you know, doing acting for the three years, a very decent amount, but to luck out and who've been with those two. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the only one I didn't get to who would fall into that category, I suppose, for me would be Julie Andrews. And unfortunately, I never crossed paths with her. Right. I love her. Yeah. Yeah. She's amazing for sure. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That's just I don't know. I have chills just thinking about like talking to Dick Van Dyke or watching him tap dance or having Angela Lansbury like make sure you're OK and have everything. you need. That's just <laughs> like, no, do you need anything? Like, you know, like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. Yeah. Just amazing. So, well, I really, great. yeah, this, I was going to say, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and do this. Uh, I know everybody in the chat has been very, very um, excited and entertained by the discussion. Every single time you weren't sure about something you said, everybody said, no, please do. We love it. We love it. Like people, they've been so supportive and so oh, encouraging nice. <laughs> the, the entire time. Everybody has just absolutely loved this. So tons of kind words. Thank you everybody in the chat for being so kind and thank you Kat for being so amazing. And, and again, just uh, granting us this uh, opportunity to look inside your amazing uh, history as, as, as an actress. That's just incredible. Thanks you guys. I can't wait to see you on social media. Please interact with me. Josh will tell you, I love to engage. So yay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, we so we do what we do a, um, a send off here um, on Resort TV one. If you want to help us with that, I basically say have a great, big, beautiful tomorrow from you know Carousel of Progress. And then my sister usually says bye bye. So if you'd like to do the bye bye, I would be honored. Let's do it. OK. All okay. right, everybody. So again, thank you to Kat. Um, and uh, we are really excited, hopefully, that we are able to schedule one of these again and we can go more in depth in some of these things. We're super excited. So thanks again. And uh, we are going to talk to you guys very soon. All right, everybody. So for now, have a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. Bye-bye.